Very good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Sahara, uh, for introducing me, for inviting me to be here. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for having me today um, to share my experiences um, in activism in Malaysia. Um, and I'm honored to be here because looking back at my uni days uh, as I was a student, I think, seven years ago, I was not as privileged as you to have this kind of event uh, to be held um, on campus uh, because, um, of course, in Malaysia, the education system is very much controlled by the government and everything that we learn is also controlled by the government and we are not really encouraged to question, we are not really encouraged to talk about issues that matter, we are not really encouraged to talk about what's happening outside the classroom, what's happening in Malaysia, what's happening in the world. So I'm, I'm very grateful to be here to share my experiences with you and my journey. Uh, what actually happened you know, between my student days until now and also to see all of you um, because it's very, very important to know that as students, you have the power to change and your voice is really, really powerful because I've worked with a lot of student activists who are part of um, today's activism and I can see the change that they have experienced in trying to get their voices heard, in trying to speak uh, for those who cannot speak, to amplify the voices of the unheard, the poor, the downtrodden, and the exploited. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's really good to see everyone here um, and also to see how progressive um, this university is to allow this space to exist for us to talk about issues that really matter. Um, I think Rob has introduced me and um, my involvement in uh, activism in Malaysia and I'm still doing what I'm doing and I'm very um, grateful that I was exposed to the world of activism when I was doing my privilege. Before I was called to the bar in 2007, um, I underwent a program under the Malaysian Bar, the Bar Council, where students, uh, it, they, they make it compulsory for students to undergo a program called Chambering, where you have to attach yourself to the Legal Aid Centre. Because in Malaysia, and like countries like the UK, for example, Legal Aid is not state-funded. For example, uh, if you go out there, you go to court, you can see a lot of people, the underprivileged people, the poor people, they don't have the right to be represented by lawyers because they don't have money and the state is not funding it, the state is not supporting that right to legal representation. So you will see like the poor being uh, locked up just because they cannot get lawyers. So they get uh, charged for various crimes but they cannot get lawyers. And sometimes they don't even understand when the charges are being read, they just say yes or no. So they don't understand the implication and they ended up being in prison for quite some time. So I got to see that when I was doing my pupillage under the Bar Council. And I got to meet people who, who don't have enough money to engage lawyers, people who are deprived of their rights as citizens of the state, people, for example, migrant workers, refugees, asylum seekers who don't get access to justice in this country. And that opened my eyes. That made me question a lot of things. What is the purpose my presence here in the society? What is the purpose of me being a lawyer? What is the purpose of being a student at that time? So it hit me quite hard at that time because I was not exposed to this reality when I was in school. And then uh, somehow um, I met a lot of people uh, during my journey who came to, to give training, to give talks about our roles as lawyers. As lawyers. What do we do to change the society to change the country, to change the world. What do we do? What are our roles as lawyers? Because in school, you, you are taught about theories and you are expected to graduate and become a lawyer and make money. And that's all that there's to it. But they don't teach you the duty of a lawyer, the sanctity of the profession. Because if you look at every profession, we have that duty to the society duty to serve the society because we are privileged enough to have education, to have knowledge, to 
have what we have now. Imagine people out there who can't even access the system, who can't even get the right to legal representation, who can't even get the right to education, who can't even express themselves because they are so burdened by what's going on around them. And we are lucky to be able to be here to change that situation because we are part of that society and that's our responsibility. It comes with the privilege that we have. Um, all right, maybe I would start with a quote from Muhammad Ali. Um, he said, service to others is the rent you pay for your room here on earth. So I think everyone knows who Muhammad Ali is, right? A great boxer, the greatest. But there's another side of him that is hardly publicized, that's hardly published or that's hardly told to us. Muhammad Ali is a social activist. Um, he is known for his greatness in the ring, but he's also a controversial figure that was heavily involved in the civil rights movement in the U.S. back in the 1960s. So Muhammad Ali at that time, he was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War and he resisted the order and it was a crime to, to resist an order from the government to serve the army at that time. And he was convicted to five years in prison and a fine of 10,000 uh, US dollars at that time in 1967 for refusing to fight in a war in Vietnam. And what was his reason? when he was asked, because it was really controversial because Muhammad Ali is someone that is very well known and when he refused to obey the state to fight in the war, he said it is against my conscience to go to Vietnam and kill. That started this whole anti-war movement in the US. It's very, very exciting at that time where everyone stood up and said no, wars will not answer the problems that we have in the world because wars only kill. And what it perpetuates is just violence. It perpetuates violence. It's not going to stop violence. So that is Muhammad Ali. A story that is hardly told, that is rarely told, that we have to take note of because it's really, really important. And also his role in the civil rights movement where he worked really closely with Martin Luther King and also um, Malcolm X, and also Nelson Mandela, because he believed in the quality of men. He believes that no one is supposed to be above another human being. We are all equal, regardless of our religion, regardless of our skin color. We are all equal, and what is due to us should be given, because it's guaranteed for the fact that we are human beings. You know, uh, that, that right, that human rights come with our birth as a human being. So I think this quote is really, really important because as, as someone who is so great, who is known throughout the world, he uses his role as the greatest to send this strong message to everyone that we have to stand for equality, we have to stand for justice, and we have to stand for freedom. He paid the price. His title, his heavyweight title was taken away from him. He could not box for five, for four years while his appeal was pending. And in the end, the Supreme Court of the United States overturned the conviction. I think because of the massive pressure, the massive support that he got with regard to his stand against wars. So he won the case. So when I talk about the struggle for example, the struggle of Muhammad Ali and the struggle of everyone in the world for freedom, for justice, for equality. What does it mean? Why is it important for us to be part of that? Because as a person, as a citizen of this country, I, I don't really understand the meaning of freedom without looking at history. For example, we are where we are here. A woman, for example, managed to get education because people before us fought for it, you know, the right to education, the right to, to be treated equally before the eyes of law, people fought really hard for it and we got it, we're privileged enough to experience it, to feel it, to taste it, 
But that freedom is not going to last forever if we don't defend it. Because the nature of authoritarianism is the same. Or authoritarian governments speak the same language. If you look at what's happening in the US a few years back, the Occupy movement that's spreading all across the world, and also what was happening uh, in Hong Kong a few weeks ago, and also in Malaysia, the heavy handedness of the police action and how the state is trying to curb freedom, that is something that is a continuous threat that we have to defend. And we have to resist because freedom is not going to exist forever because people fought for it and we have to continue fighting for it because authoritarian governments won't stop defending their position of power and we as citizens have to keep on resisting because that's that's the reaction that they're going to get from suppressing from oppressing the people the masses so i think as students you have to really understand what does it mean to, to have that freedom, to have that privilege to be here, to have that privilege to live a decent living, and to see the world outside that is not that privileged, to see the people sometimes, you don't have to go far, you just look around you, people who do odd jobs, for example, the cleaners, for example. Maybe you can start asking questions, how much they are paid? What about their kids? Are they able to come to school? Are they able to, to, to get the education that we get? Are they able to express what we are expressing? Are they able to even go to travel? Are they even able to eat good food? These are the questions that we have to start asking ourselves because then only we will understand that what we have is only limited to us. And what we have is something that they themselves have that right to have. And I think that's really, really important to start giving meaning to what we are doing. I mean, as, as a person, as a student, as a lawyer, as a journalist, if you graduate one day and you become what you want to become, you have to give meaning to that profession so that it becomes meaningful and you will have a fulfilling life and you will not regret it. I think my experience can, I can, I can relate to this a lot because I've gone through this journey and these experiences and for me, I, I cannot imagine not doing what I'm doing right now because as you see the world is unfolding and how we are sinking deeper and deeper, you need someone, you need people, you don't have to be heroes. We don't need heroes to lead us. You don't have to be heroes to do extraordinary things. You just have to do the right thing you just have to stand up for the right thing. Always stand up for freedom. Always stand up for justice and equality. Always see other people as your equals. And I think that's really, really important in order to give meaning to what you do and to give meaning to your own life, your own existence in this world. Consciousness. I mean, a lot of people say that, I mean, not everyone is aware of what's going on. You, know, you can't demand that everyone wakes up one day and be aware or conscious of their surroundings. Of course, it comes, uh, it comes with a lot of um, stories, a lot of experiences, narratives. It doesn't just happen in one day. But you can always seek. You can always find meaning of what you're doing, the meaning of what you want to become by looking at the world around you and also the world beyond you. You know, when you read the news, when you read people get beaten up by the police for expressing themselves in a peaceful assembly, it should hit you, you know, because it's not right for a state to behave like that because it's quite it's quite the norm that everyone has the right to assemble, everyone has the right to themselves, but what they are doing right now is it, it shows the power relations that are unequal and therefore we have to intervene, we have to be part of that, we have to defend that right because it's something that is already accorded to us. I mean, in most constitutions, those fundamental rights are already guaranteed and why is the state taking it away from us? It shows that they feel threatened by what we have to say, they feel threatened by our resistance to oppression, to injustice. So it shows that 
Even though citizens, we are unarmed, all that we have is our voice, the government is still threatened by it. So it shows the people how when you, when you look at uh, movement songs, social movement songs, you know, like power to the people, power to the people. What does it mean, power to the people? People, ordinary people, people like you and me, people out there, we can make a change. If we do something, no matter how small it is, because it will always threaten the power, and they will react, and that shows how strong we are if we stand together and united to resist oppression, injustice, and inequality. And then, when you become conscious of what's going on around you, you will have this anger you know, of seeing injustice. It's something that, that will possess you at some point when you see in front of your eyes an act of injustice being perpetrated. I remember, I think, when I was in my second year of practice, law practice, I was stationed in Masjid Jami in Kuala Lumpur City Centre with uh, my colleagues from the Legal Aid Centre where at that time there was a massive, there was a big demonstration to call for the abolition of the Internal Security Act which allowed uh, detention without trial. For example, if you say something that is deemed as a threat to the national security, you can be called up questioned by the police for 60 days without the presence of your lawyers and you will be detained indefinitely for two years and that detention order can be renewed without having to go to court. So if let's say you want to prove yourself that no, I did not do this, for example, you cannot do that because that act takes away that right from being heard in the court law. So 30,000 people attended that rally. I was part of the organizing committee and I was also part of the Legal Aid Center Urgent Arrest Team where we were stationed in Masjid Jamek, the, the point of assembly. Um, 30,000 people started marching to the Merdeka Square. I remember there was a commotion. I was stationed on the 10th floor uh, of the Legal Aid Center. And then I, I, I just had to see what was going on because we, we saw uh, FRU trucks, uh, water cannons, uh, like tear gas. So I had to see what was going on because everyone was peaceful at that time. They were just trying too much to the Medeca Square to, to, to call for the abolition of uh, the Internal Security Act. Tear gas endlessly at that time. That was my anger. And seeing that, you know, it, it, from that day, I, was, I told myself, I have to do something about this and I cannot stop doing this because this is how they're treating the ordinary citizens. There are um, people out there with impunity. I have to stand up, I have to do somehow find a way to make them accountable and not going to stop doing this. And the demonstration went on, a lot of people were beaten up, um, detained uh, without having the right to see their lawyers and the next day I still remember the newspaper and you know, it's, it, the, all the efforts that we took uh, were not in vain and even though they faced it with something uh, that is equally abusive but at least they don't want to carry that name with them because they know how bad it is I mean, because every time we go to the UN uh, Human Rights Council, NGOs like Suara together with other NGOs will go and lobby the other governments to say that Malaysia does not deserve to sit on this Human Rights Council because we have repressive, abusive, draconian laws that are used to silence people. So for me, that is, that is something that is very precious. Uh, it shows how people and their anger can actually change something and we, 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 we are glad that finally they have to surrender because of the pressure uh, that was put by the people. I think challenges. Of course, uh, when you stand up for something that is right, you will always be questioned by your peers and sometimes by your parents and sometimes by, by your friends. Even, uh, it's, it's not easy, of course, but one thing that I can assure you is this. When you choose the right path, when you know what you're standing for, when you are clear of your vision and mission, what you want to do you know, to make yourself uh, 
a good human being, you know, that can serve the society and the people, it's always, it's not going to be, it's not going to be, um, some, it, how do I put it, uh, it's not going to be something that, that is not meaningful. You know, it, it is meaningful because you will always find other people with you. You will always find people who are selfless, people who keep doing the right thing for years and years and years and they've never given up on anything because for them this is what their life is all about, this is what they stand for and this is what they believe in and no matter what happened to them, they, they will not change their position, they will continue fighting the fight and I'm, I'm grateful to be able to meet some of them if you've heard of uh, the late Irene Fernandez, um, she is an, she was an amazing human being. I think she she was fighting this fight since forever. Um, she passed away this year, early this year, and she was actually convicted uh, by the court for exposing uh, abuse and mistreatment of uh, migrant workers in detention camps, migrant workers, asylum seekers, and refugees in the detention camps in Sevenye. Uh, yeah, not far from here. Um, she she became this figure that is respected by everybody because she would never she would never give in, and she she taught me a lot about what activism is all about. And she she is one of my idols, and she passed away this year. And I was not here in Malaysia at that time, but I read stories. Um, news about her funeral and how grateful people were for her efforts and for her contributions to make this world a better place. And she's, she's amazing. I mean, maybe you can just Google Irene Fernandez and you would know how amazing she was. And yeah, she's, she's a great human being, I would say, and I'm very privileged to have her. And also, Alright, maybe someone that you can always read or you can draw inspiration from is always uh, Howard Zinn. If you've heard of Howard Zinn, Howard Zinn is an American historian, a uh, social activist who was very, very active in organizing, mobilizing people at that time, uh, trying to fight this, uh, in the struggle for civil rights in the US. And that's this book that he wrote. Uh, it's uh, called You Can't Be Neutral on Moving Train. I read that book when I first started my law practice and it has become like my moral compass and every time I feel down, every time I feel hopeless, I would always remember what he said in that book. And in that book, um, in the final chapter, he said this, to be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending the spinning top of the world in a different direction. And if we do act, in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents, and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. I think his quote is really, really powerful to show how much we have as a human being to bring about change, to make an impact. Even if we cannot change the world, if we can change the life of a person, if we can help someone ease their burden, that is itself a marvelous victory. If you read this book, you will see how, how it's seen as an educator, together with students, they organize themselves to start talking about civil rights, to start talking about equality, to start talking about racism that is in the country at that time. He was arrested once 
when he was in a car with a black student, with his black student, because it's a crime to be in the same car with a black student. So all these stories are really amazing to give you the inspiration that you need to face the world. Because like it or not, even if we try to ignore what's going on outside, we can't help but ask our conscience, you know? Can I stay silent? Should I remain silent or should I do something? It doesn't have to be a grand act. It can be the smallest thing that you can do to change or to make a change. You can always participate in a lot of things. For example, in Malaysia, uh, I think around the world, homelessness has become a major issue. Even in, in, in countries uh, like Canada, like the US, it's a big issue. Like Malaysia, homelessness, because inequality is something that we cannot ignore. The gap is widening as we speak. And I remember a few months ago when the Minister of the Federal Territory said that they would criminalize the act of homelessness and they would arrest people who give food to homeless people. A lot of people are outraged. Uh, the, the civil society, the NGOs, the soup kitchens are angry because they will be closed down by the government by force if they keep doing what they're doing. I remember when the uh, minister said that, one day they organized a soup kitchen in, in Kuala Lumpur, in, uh, on Jalan Pango, where a lot of people will come and just give out food in defiance of the plan by the minister. A lot of people turned out, students, civil servants even. Uh, a lot of people, ordinary Malaysians, uh, non-Malaysians, they, they came and they, they participated in the event and basically they are trying to send a message to the government that there's nothing that you can do to stop us. We will continue doing this because you are not doing your job to fight homelessness. You're not doing your job to wage war against poverty. But we are, we are actually doing your job and now we are trying to crack down what we are doing. It's something that is never acceptable and that's what we do. And a few days after that, the minister announced that the plan to close all the soup kitchens was uh, suspended. They are not going to continue with that. So for us, it's a big victory because the soup kitchens can continue doing what they are doing. And yeah, uh, uh, and also at the same time, uh, organizing, trying to push for law reform in order to get the government to focus on the right issue. It is not about criminalizing the homeless people. It's about addressing poverty. It's about addressing inequality. It's about managing the wealth of the country in order to make these people live a better life, not to put them in prison because it's not going to help solve the problem of homelessness and poverty and inequality. And also maybe I can also relate to you my personal experience. Um, in 2009, uh, uh, Zahara mentioned about me being arrested. Uh, that was my first experience uh, being in the lockout for one night. It was not a lovely experience because you got to see how atrocious the lockout conditions are and how this whole notion of humanity is some kind of illusory because that's how we treat people in this day and age. If you've heard about this during the, the medieval times, it's, it's, it's quite normal. But it's still happening in this day and age where we claim ourselves to be a democracy, when we claim ourselves to be the modern society, but we still see people being treated like subhuman as if they, they don't have the dignity just because they are arrested, just because they are suspected of crimes, even if they are a criminal. The law does not allow you to treat them like subhumans because the law is not just about punishing people, it's about reform. It's about trying to create a society that is, um, that is caring, a society that cares about other people, that is trying to solve the problem. Why do people commit crimes, for example? You know, why, why, why is the prison so crowded with the poor, for example? Why are the poor not accorded the right to legal representation when they're arrested? So when I was arrested at that time, um, an academic, uh, uh, Wong Chin Huai, he was arrested for uh, starting a campaign, uh, one black Malaysia campaign, 
following uh, an illegal power grab in the state of Para. So he started this campaign. It's called One Black Democracy. He urged everyone to wear black on Saturday to show that democracy is dying in this country. And he was arrested under the Sedition Act. The Sedition, the Sedition Act that is still used until today to silence criticism, to stop people from expressing their opinions, from to talk to stop people from expressing their dissenting views. So he was arrested under that act for three days. So he was brought from one police station to another for investigation. So his friends, his activist friends, uh, held a candlelight vigil in front of the police station to call for his release. They were arrested. So at that time, I served the legal aid center. So whenever people get arrested for participating in uh, peaceful assemblies, we would always render our assistance to, to get them out of, of uh, the police station. So we got a call, so I went, uh, it was at night, I went with uh, four of my friends in front of the police station and said, um, we got a call, some people were arrested, they are all our clients, and we want to see them because they have every right to see the lawyers. So they stopped us from going in, they closed the gate, and they said, no, you, you're not allowed to see these people and they kept telling our clients that we are not there to represent them, that we've gone home and nobody's going to see them. So because they, they, they keep uh, demanding for lawyers uh, because the police said no, we're not going to allow you to see anyone. So they said no, this is our right, we want to see our lawyers, we know that our lawyers are outside waiting for us. Uh, I mean the police kept lying to us and also to them, just trying to deny us the right from seeing them. So after standing at the gate for one and a half hour, uh, the OCPD, the, the head of the police station came out with a loud leader. He said, please disperse now or, or else you'll be arrested for participating in an illegal assembly. So me and my friends, we decided not to, to, to disperse because we are still on duty trying to get access to our clients. And we can see uh, some journalists are still standing, uh, taking photos. Uh, I can hear the camera clicking, uh, trying to get the news out. And he counted from, I think, five, uh, five, four, three, two, one. He opened the gate, and we were all arrested. At that time, I was so shocked. I was stunned because I think for the first time, uh, lawyers were arrested while on duty. It's like arresting doctors while trying to give medical assistance. It doesn't make sense. It's just ridiculous. So when, when we got arrested, after they, they put us in, in a place uh, to wait for the for the police officer to take to take down our details and all that, we started laughing. Me and my friends, we started laughing because it was just ridiculous and we couldn't understand what was going on at that time. And we were put in lockup for one night. Uh, we thought that we were going to be charged for that and the next day, uh, the next day being in the lockup, uh, we couldn't see because there's no pillow, uh, there's no blanket uh, and the toilet has no doors so it's just atrocious to be in there, you know, I mean the, the, the anxiety that we get in, in waiting and waiting and waiting and suddenly they came and they said okay, uh, I mean, uh, we were going to bring you to a place now so we said, are you going to charge us? Are you going to bring us to court? You refuse to talk to us? So we know nothing at that time. They refused to even tell us the basic information about our condition at that time. And later we found out that we were being released. And after that, um, I think the Bar Council, uh, they, they lodged a complaint with the National Human Rights Commission as to the violation of the right to legal representation. And uh, we won the case uh, and then Two years after that, we filed a civil suit against the police and the government for unlawful arrest and detention of five legal aid lawyers. And this year, on the 23rd of May, we won the case in the High Court. And the High Court awarded 75,000 ringgit uh, in damages. And uh, for us, it, it, it's a big victory. <laughs> and it sent a strong message to the police and the government not to interfere with lawyers who are just nearly discharging their duties to their clients. So I think um, it's, it's bittersweet, of course. Um, it, it's, it's amazing to have experienced and to have witnessed how things unfold. And it's, it's good to be part of this whole uh, story.
struggle because you get to learn from people who have been there for quite some time and you get to learn from new people who are so passionate about doing what they're doing. If you've heard of Adam Hati, yeah, he's a, uh, he was a student at Oopsie. Uh, there was one incident where a group of students were marching to see a minister to hand over a memorandum to call for the abolition of uh, UUCA, the act that uh, stops students from being politically involved, from being involved in politics and uh, taking part in politics or basically for expressing their political views. So they marched to see this minister. So this guy, Adam Adli, he was there. There was like a flag of, uh, a Malaysian flag flying. He brought down the flag and he replaced it with a student flag. And then everyone went to search. Everyone went crazy because they said, how dare you do that to the national flag? You're trying to insult Malaysia. So all these nationalists trying to use this against him by saying that, see, he's insulting this country. So he was suspended indefinitely by the this university. We challenged the case in court, but we lost. But right after that, that uh, one particular section of the, the act uh, was abolished uh, because um, the court found that uh, the, the provision is unconstitutional because every student has the right to be part of political activities to express their political views. So that 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 was followed by the incident of Madam uh, bringing down the, the flag. And right now, his his uh, I mean, after that, he was arrested under the Sedition Act for saying that we need to change the government because. Uh, it's not working anymore. They've been in power for so, uh, for so long. All these abuses and violations of rights have to stop. So he said that in, in an event. Uh, he was called up by the police, uh, arrested, and charged under the Sedition Act. Now his case is still pending in court. Uh, he has, uh, he's, he's now studying in uh, Brickfields Asia College. Uh, he's reading law <laughs> because he wanted to change the law. And, uh, I think his case, the, the decision of his case is coming up soon, so if he's convicted, that means he would have to be in prison. And he said, it's okay, I'll continue reading law in prison. Mandela did that for 27 years. Mandela got his law degree in prison. So he said, yeah, I mean, that, that can be my inspiration. And he was not scared when, when he was asked about that question. So that was Adam Ali uh, and the incident of the Malaysian flag. Um, yeah, I, I, I had the privilege to represent him in the police station and also in one of his court cases. And he's now active with Bercy. Bercy is a coalition for free and fair elections. And he does not seem to regret what he did. And that's the same case uh, that I get to witness, I think, uh, when people got arrested for being part of the democratic process when people got beaten up by the police, when I got to see them after the incident, trying to bring them to the police station to lodge a report, trying to lodge a complaint with the National Human Rights Commission. Every time I talk to them, like ordinary citizens, they're like, we never regret it. Are you scared? No, I'm not. They might be scared in the beginning, but after that incident, it just strengthens their resolve to stand up for something and to fight for justice and all the notions that I just mentioned as well. So all these people, they always inspire me. They are the ones who give me hope, and they are the ones who uh, reaffirm my decision to be in this cause and to, to continue doing what I'm doing. So yeah, I think that's all that I have to share with all of you. Thank you so much.
as I know, being an activist means, means that you don't earn as much as being an economist or engineering and whatnot. So my question is, how do you actually sustain your life throughout the journey in a way? Uh, I think that is one of the challenges that a lot of activists face. Um, I'm a full-time lawyer and I'm practicing law full-time. So I'm quite lucky because my boss allows me to do this on the side. He, he said that you know this is part of my contribution, you can do this. Uh, because I need to work, because I need to sustain myself. Sustain. Yeah, I think that's that's a valid question. But at the same time, I think I have a lot of activist friends who work. Uh, they're not paid that much, but somehow they manage to, to get by. And uh, it's always, I think, you just have to know how to to organize your time and how to, to, to find that balance. Uh, it's not easy, but it can be done. I'm still doing it. Uh, it's been seven years. Uh, I'm planning. Uh, I, I I did stop working for two years to join an NGO to do it full time, and for me it was really fulfilling because you get to focus on on, on doing what you're doing. Um, for me, people came with rights activism, and of course, I mean along the journey you will find a way to focus on what you love and you will find the right people, the right place and the right time, the right opportunity for you to go there. So I think I'm very lucky. Uh, a lot of my friends are, are experiencing the same thing uh, because we are not too happy doing what we're doing because sometimes you, you you can't do much because you have to focus on work because you, you are available to your clients for example you know, as engineers, as doctors, as lawyers but at the same time you try to find that time. If you're free on the weekends, do it on the weekend. You can always connect with different people in different places, different times. You can always do that. Uh, it can be done. It's not impossible. Don't worry. But if you know what you want to do, if you know that this is my fate, this is what I'm going to be doing, this is what I'm going to be good at, this is my passion, you will find that way. You will always find the right people who will help you find the way and one day you will be able to do what you love and what you're most passionate about and that's very fulfilling sometimes no matter how much you earn it, it, it's nothing compared to the experiences of having to be with people on the ground doing things that really matter to change things to make a difference that feeling will always stay with you it's very fulfilling I mean sometimes you buy stuff right you buy things You'll be happy for a period of time, but then you forget. But when you do this kind of thing, it's it's something that money can never buy for me. It's something that stays with you forever. It's very rich and it's very fulfilling. Try it. <laughs> yeah. Question? Um, well, you mentioned the law for the homeless people. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important as an activist to understand what are the motives for the government. And I'm not up to date on this issue. So could you please explain to me what is the motive of the government to prohibit giving food to homeless people? Yeah, I think because uh, homeless, homelessness is always seen as something that is obstructing. Uh, for example, they always use this argument as if you see homeless people on the, uh, on the road, uh, in the streets, you know, tourists will feel will somehow be affected by that view. So they don't want these people to tarnish the image of this country. They want people to see that oh, everyone is living a decent life. No one is living in the streets. No one is sleeping in the streets. So that's what they want to, to portray. So that's why they have this law that we have. Um, uh, it's um, destitute persons act. Uh, it's a colonial law uh, that was used during the British times and they continue using it until now trying to criminalize the act of giving uh, the act of asking for help I mean this is for the homeless people and also for people who are trying to help these people so I think it is actually meant to just bury the whole problem and trying to make it not visible because trying to address the issue of poverty and homelessness is something that requires dedication and requires determination and also genuine efforts from the government because it's about inequality, it's about the distribution of wealth in this country, for example, even in other countries because the trend is the same as we see uh, even in the UK, uh, in the US, how they're trying to, to push all these people away is by to crim criminalize the act of homelessness and 
that, like I said, authoritarianism speaks the same language, right? So it's the same thing, even in Malaysia. So that's why I think uh, it's really important to look at the law. The law should basically help these people and get them out of that condition, of that situation. But it is basically trying to put them in prison so that we won't see them. So that people will come, oh, Malaysia is perfect, it's developing, we can see nice buildings and no one begging. So that's what they want uh, to portray. This is something that has to be resisted. Hi, my name is Lavanya and I'm really sorry I came late. That was rude of me. Um, I have a question. Do you think it's better to have a partisan or non-partisan approach to activism, be it human rights or political activism? Which way is more effective to bring about the change you want? Um, I would say uh, in activism, uh, effectiveness in your method is really important. Uh, so sometimes you, you have no choice but to collaborate with uh, political parties that are in favour of your cause because at the end of the day we need political will. Uh, for example, uh, last week, uh, Suaram, uh, we went to Parliament to brief uh, parliamentarians with regard to this act. It is called the Dangerous Drugs Act. Uh, basically, people who, are, uh, who, who do drugs can just be arrested without having to go to court. So this law is actually abused because the police can just like use this to, to make money. For example, if they will just arrest anyone and say that, we are not going to bring you to court, you can be detained for two years and it can be renewed in another two years. It's like the ISA, Internal Security Act, but it deals with drugs cases. Uh, uh, so we went to court to lobby the parliamentarians because the motion will be tabled soon where uh, the act will be renewed. Uh, so we talked to the parliamentarians to say that this act is against the principles of human rights. This act basically gives room to the police to abuse their power. Corruption uh, will be on the rise if you allow this to happen and we have to stop uh, talking about laws that are draconian to address these problems. We need to talk about effective policy instead of using a draconian law to so-called eradicate these problems. So we talk to them so that they can bring this up in parliament during the debate. So I think it's really important to find a partnership because sometimes you need that done and sometimes you should remain neutral in that sense because uh, sometimes you, you would have to answer to people because sometimes people say that oh, you are your pro-opposition or your pro-government so you have to play according to the issues and also to, to your goals what your goals are for example, we went to parliament to lobby these parliamentarians because we need them to bring this in parliament because we NGOs cannot be in parliament to debate it so we give them points, we give them statistics we give them cases where they can highlight this in order not to get that motion passed. So you always have to be creative to, to build alliances because at the end of the day you want your goals to materialize. So it comes with uh, experiences and also uh, success stories and sometimes put into lock up. So what do you think? Um, how do people to improve on their internet Alright, uh, for me, internet, uh, social media, it should be a medium. Uh, it should be uh, one of the ways that we can use to reach out to the mass, uh, to the public at large. Uh, it shouldn't be focused only on the internet, only on Facebook. Sometimes you can see like hundreds of likes on Facebook, but it does not translate well into actions. So for me, it should be used to convey messages. It should be used to educate people. It can be used to conscientize people about issues. But at the end of the day, what matters is what's going on on the ground. You always have to go on the ground and start organizing people to, to, to take some actions. It's because action speaks louder than words, right? I mean, of course, the government will be like, okay, hundreds of lives. But when, at the end of the day, they want to see real people doing real job on the ground, resisting and showing their presence, I think that is really important. So activism in that sense hasn't changed because we just find a new way to make it easier uh, because if you look at uh, the Arab Awakening, uh, the Occupy movements, and right now it's, uh, the Umbrella Revolution in, in Hong Kong, they use all this um, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram to get people to understand the issues and also to get people to be wild up. 
and to get people to be angry and to start doing something like tangible and visible on the ground. I think that's really, really important. So it's, it complements activism. It makes it easier compared to those days where you have to send messages to hundreds of people to organize a rally. Sometimes I always ask my friends who, who have been doing this for 20 years, 30 years, that how, I mean, it, I cannot imagine doing it back then, you know. You really have to go like lifting, do lifting, and ask people to come for the rally. Uh, but they did it. Yeah. Many people turned up, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing, uh, the same uh, nature of activism, but the, the mode, the method is different. And now it's much easier for us uh, in this day and age where internet is almost accessible to everyone. So we should use that as an advantage, uh, you know, uh, in trying to get people to, to be on board. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew. There have been instances where there's a court verdict taking place, but then it's not fully realized. So as an activist and a lawyer, how would you comment on the state of the justice system? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, for example, uh, there are cases where, uh, I think recently, this year, uh, about a case of uh, police brutality, uh, a man named Ugen, he was beaten up so bad, he died in custody, and they said that he died because of pneumonia, and then uh, uh, a lot of activists uh, took up this case, and we finally uh, uh, filed the case in court for for damages because of unlawful actions by the police, and the court uh, awarded uh, damages to the mother uh, who filed the case on behalf of Kogan, and uh, the court actually said that uh, the police have to stop inflicting injuries on people. Under their care. The police station should be the safest place on earth, not you know, a place where people are brought in alive and end up being dead. So that's what he said, but the police for them, it's they did. Uh, cases of police brutality continue until today. Um, they, they, they don't really care about what, what the court says because the system there's no system to check their action because in this country, for example, in the UK, you have uh, an independent body to check the police. For example, if the police unlawfully shoot someone, he will be investigated by this independent body. But in Malaysia, uh, that's one of the struggles uh, of the civil society organizations where we are pushing for the setting up of IBCMC. It's an independent uh, oversight body to check the police whenever they do something that is against the law. Until now, we're still pushing for that uh, because uh, in the absence of this, uh, in the absence of this uh, system, uh, you can see how police, uh, you know, they, they can do things with impunity and no one is accountable. So all these civil suits uh, that were filed in court before, uh, we were just trying to get people to understand uh, the meaning of accountability, the meaning of impunity, so that they will be with us whenever we want to push for the setting up of this independent body to oversee the police. Hi, um, just in from your stories, there's uh, a lot of time where you've had to put yourself in danger um, for what you believe in, and I was wondering how you assess when it, when, it's, when it is the right time to put yourself in danger and when you need to look after yourself. Oh, um, yes, I think uh, um, in my experience, I would say that sometimes, you know, being young and uh, having this anger with you, you would want to do something that might be detrimental or dangerous, but uh, you always, for me, I always have friends who are more experienced who tell me that, okay, I mean, this is the limit, and don't go beyond that. I mean, uh, I mean you, you learn along the way, I think. Uh, to, uh, for example, if you go for municipal assembly, you see like police chasing you or tear gassing you. So instead of going forward, maybe you should retreat and try to find an alternative to that. Uh, try not to put yourself in in, uh, in that position. So when people say that, oh, I don't want to go to a municipal assembly because I don't want to be arrested. Uh, actually, it's not true because you can avoid from being arrested. Uh, for example, uh, you, you don't because you're not 
usually in, in peaceful assemblies you have leaders uh, or civil society organizations who would always lead the way and they are prepared for, for that, they are prepared to be arrested. So you know when to stand, for example, not to be that close to them, for example. So you just, you, I mean, it comes with experience actually. So you, at some point you will understand how it works and you will be able to make that decision. So I was arrested not during an, an assembly, but I was arrested while trying to discharge my duty. It was really unexpected because, you, I mean, I've been um, uh, representing a lot of people who got arrested and going in and out police station, trying to get people out. Uh, it was quite normal for me. But at that time, you just, at that time, I knew that I had to stay here because I'm still on duty and I cannot abandon my clients because that's my responsibility. So I think I did the right thing because a friend of mine at that time, he freaked out. He said, Fadia, what do we do? Do we leave or we stay? Because he said that we are part of an illegal assembly and he would arrest us if we don't leave. So I said, no, we stay. I said, stay. We are here to see our clients stay. So I think I made the right call. I made the right judgment at that time. So uh, I didn't regret that. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it comes with experience and you, when you are on the ground, you just know what to do, not to put yourself in danger or you should stay on or it, it's, it's, it's just, it will happen there and you will learn, I think, from what's going on around you and from the people around you. So, not too dangerous. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I add to that? I think the danger for, well, for the less brave of us going out there are two. One is police brutality in the context of Malaysia. The fear that the police will come Come, come and charging you with tear gas, with the batons and stuff. And uh, that's a real fear that those of us who've been on the bigger marches uh, experience. This that's a fear I experience. It's a very real fear. The other fear, and that's why we always say, let's have thousands there. Yeah? Because once you've got thousands there, the troublemakers are fearful of things coming in. You know what I mean? It's not so much the police there, it's about the extreme groups, they are the ones who really are anti-democratic or there to look for trouble, the hooligans. I mean, quite recently in Penang, for example, uh, there was a peaceful at Speaker's Corner in Penang, uh, a group of uh, pro-democracy people, anti-sedition people, uh, went there and they were attacked virtually uh, by a mob, essentially uh, in Penang. There is this mob, people say, largely supported by the ruling party. Uh, and they were swearing at them. It's on, it's on YouTube, you want to see. They were cursing them. There was these two uh, occasion demonstrators there who were running participants. They were sworn at, they were cursed. And uh, the police were there, but they were not doing anything. They were just, you know, they were just there, you know. So there, is, there are those two fears that you have. When you have a massive rally, at least my experience, when you have a massive rally at Bursi, the fear isn't of those people. Because they are too scared to come there, there are too few of them. Yeah? But the fear is of police, uh, police uh, attacks, uh, uh, tear gas attacks. Padia says, and it's right, you, you follow certain groups, you, you stay in particular positions, you are able to hide or run or whatever. But once they start throwing tear gas as they did in Bursi 3, right? Bursi 3, indiscriminately when they start shooting the tear gas off and they start charging <laughs> many of us were totally confused you know we were running left and right and we just didn't know because once the tear gas gets into your eyes it's no joke really you know uh, it's, it's really it was really not painful. very nice yeah and we're like me where the heart stop doing this even worse if it weren't for a couple of my ex students who were there I think I would have died uh, because we were trapped in a corner but anyway, that's my story. That's <laughs> but the point is, you have two fears, I think. The fear of extremist groups, well, of hooligans, and the fear of the police themselves in the context of the But the last rally was the, the, the lawyer's rally, you know, the last Thursday. Uh, the lawyer's rally against the Sedition Act. Lawyers' rallies are great because nobody touches lawyers. <laughs> They're so scared they'll be sued to death. You got arrested too many lawyers. Yeah, the police were so kind. They're always so kind to lawyers, you know, especially lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> they 
dress in a hot sun. That's what is happening on that Thursday. But those kind of rallies are fun. So, you know, there are rallies and there are rallies, I guess, you know. And uh, I think one shouldn't see rallies as something that's not for me to do, you know. It's, uh, a lot of Malaysians feel that way. You know, my sister, my elder sister called me, are you going on that way? Are you crazy? Why, you know, I mean, you've got a job, you've got a family, you know. But I think it's part of, for me, it's part of my duty as a citizen. Yeah. Uh, I think that's something that needs to be done. Of course, on Thursday, I took leave. You have to take leave. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you do it the proper way, you know. I wrote to my head department, Sean, and said, I was just your leave. So I think, as long as you do things in a proper manner, I, I don't think, especially young ones, should be fearful of this. You all can run very well. <laughs> yeah, that really helps. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and a lot more of the young uh, Malaysians are seeing that there is a need for, for, for at least to show, yeah, uh, in relation to that question about internet activism. Yeah, uh, I think Fadia is right in the sense that internet activism as a starting point for rallying people, yeah, for getting to know is something that's a revelation this this day and age. I mean, we didn't have that in old days of Valera. But it cannot end there. It should not end there. A lot of people put their lights and so on and so forth. And that's the end of it. Your activism isn't there. Yeah. That's a sign of your discontent, but it has to be beyond that, I feel. Uh, I feel that way. And, uh, and, uh, and, and thank that, sorry, just to quickly, uh, before we go on, your ideas, your thoughts about how to uh, finance yourself. You'd be amazed once you network. I can tell you that this is the important thing to network, to know there are other people who are concerned about what you're doing as well. That not, not only Malaysia, but it's a regional thing, it's a world thing. Yeah? So once you start networking, you'll be amazed at how you can sustain yourself. More recently, for example, with this sedition arrest, right? Uh, Wong Chi Huat, the academic who's now with the Nang Institute, was arrested for this sedition a couple of years ago, a friend of ours. He started this idea that we should fund uh, those people who are being charged. Yeah? And I think it is a viable idea because if you have a million Malaysian citizens who are concerned, and each comes out with 50 ringgit, for example, right? and middle classes now can afford 50 ringgit, a million is 50 million ringgit. Yeah? And that for him would help to sustain the payment of the bail. of the bail and stuff like that. And it would help families, because a lot of these young people also have families. Yeah, the most recent one was arrested and re-arrested and now has gone mm -hmm. yeah, has, has been sentenced, yeah. Uh, that young activist, he's got a family as well. So I think and many of us are very supportive of that. And we will, you know, anonymously or whatever, we will provide that kind of you'll be surprised. Yeah. The relations can be very generous as well. <laughs> 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 yeah, the comments or questions? Like what next, for example? Yeah. Like what about the delineation exercise? I think. How many of you can vote here? Now. How many of you have reached the age where you can vote? I think the next stage, I feel, like, since this is a conversation between you and me, right? <laughs> 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 At the next stage, uh, I think Fadia is in a better position to talk about this. The next stage is what do we do next, right? I mean, you can demonstrate, you can rally, but many people are becoming very tired of this, you know, because there's no end in sight. But I think the biggest fear now is that the next elections, which is what, 2000, why well, all of you should be able to vote, uh, is 2014 now, 2000, latest will be 2018. I think it's going to be earlier than that, but before that, there's going to be this, what's called this delineation exercise, yeah? Malaysia's, that's another thing I think all of us need to be aware of, that a political system is not a democratic one. It's a first past the post system, and you have certain areas which have 10,000 people, certain areas which have 100,000 people, but certain constitutions with 10,000 people will have one parliamentarian there, with 100,000 people will also have one parliamentarian there. So it's just one tenth of the 100,000, but yet we have only one parliamentarian for both. This is what the whole delineation exercise is all about now, right? That has been the game all this time. Not about so much about phantom voters and so on and so forth. They've got it down pat in, in a way that they have 
the racial delineation exercise where certain constitutions will essentially vote for them for and for what is that like? Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's a very, very undemocratic system and Wong Jin Park and Gang gonna say about are uh, going out to try to explain to people how undemocratic it is and how people ought to speak up yeah, when they conduct this delineation exercise. Yeah. I think there is that that's important, the education that you need to go through because all of you are going to be able to vote. And even if you vote, if you're in the rural, in the, in the urban areas, even if you vote, mm, if, if you vote ADU, yeah, anything but I don't know, you vote that way also, it doesn't mean they will lose. Yeah? Because, you know, they've got like their, their voting bank in East Malaysia, for example. That's, so there is a need for, to convince the people in East Malaysia about democratic practices, about undemocratic practices as well. So the job of activists is, is, is a, a full-time job now, leading up to it has to be now, and that's why we need St. Clark, for example, <laughs> to work with us, you know? <laughs> 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 Not just go on Facebook, you know? <laughs> just joking, you know? <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> but yeah. Any comments? Any? Uh, didacticism, which is sort of like uh, 
teaching and educating the public on these social uh, issues through uh, literature or, or plays or something. I think it's, it's really important, I think, uh, among students, uh, to, because some people, when we talk about the notion of freedom, you know, we can't imagine. What, what do you mean freedom? It's like, it's a big word, but some people can't really relate to it. So I think for me, I got that realization in school when I was in my jurisprudence class, when we start talking about uh, the philosophy of law, what law is all about, and, and the, the, the objective of the law, so I, I started questioning, oh, I mean, all these questions, right, uh, about our role as a person, as a lawyer, as a doctor, uh, and also our duty to, to the public, to the society. So I think this discussion should continue because uh, it, it encourages people to start thinking and uh, engage in critical discussion about issues that are quite complex at times, particularly when it comes to race and religion and how the government is trying to control the discussion and trying to suppress people from expressing their opinions with regard to all these issues. So I think it's very, very important. And I can see that a lot on the internet, on Facebook, and some people organize themselves and they sit down and start talking about the notion of freedom. What does it mean? You know, um, what does it mean to be free? Uh, is it okay for the government to use um, uh, words like security or harmony and peace, I mean, does it really have meaning? You know, all these words, uh, but, but yeah, I mean, it's very important because by understanding all these notions, then only we will understand the nature of oppression that is surrounding us, and it will get us to wake up and do something about it. If you don't really understand how serious all these issues are, I mean, it's going to be problematic going to be difficult for us to do something because we don't really believe in it fully. So if you really believe in it, you, you, your conviction is clear, then your action will be solid and you will do something about it. <coughs> Any more comments? Uh, questions? No? No? Uh, can we show our appreciation to Fadiyah?